uh, moving on to uh, a beautiful, again, a beautiful talk uh, and emphasizing the importance of the UN SDGs and how sustainability can play a role and the importance of partnerships uh, in uh, also cancer control. Allow me to present our next speaker, Mrs. Dina Fakhouri, who is the executive director of the United Nations Global Compact Network, Lebanon, which is a network of businesses committed to advancing sustainability and the sustainable development goals, SDGs in Lebanon. Dina carries a collective multidisciplinary long-standing experience within the corporate and the NGO spheres. With a thorough background as a retail expert, a business development consultant, and a long-standing expertise in communication and marketing, Dina's career pathway primarily revolved around establishing and structuring business units, creating concepts, developing franchises, and implementing the business process in vast area of retail and distribution operations. Combining the corporate world and the NGO's world has been her strive for almost two decades, with a firm belief that collective action and a close cross-sectorial partnerships are the key to building a sustainable path for a national and a global recovery. She's driven by this manifesto and has enrolled in many senior volunteer endeavors throughout her career. And also her motto, which I found beautiful also to share, a little by each, a lot by everyone. Dina, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Karen, for the introduction. This is, um, I'm very thrilled to be here and I'm going to just share with you my screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Just let me, okay. okay. All right, perfect, now we do. Okay, sorry, excuse me but I seem to have lost my, anyway, I will bring it from here. Okay, so uh, basically talking about the agenda, thank you, Karen, for the introduction about sustainability and the SDGs, because it's something that is very dear to our heart. Mm -hmm. And um, today we'll be focusing on two main uh, SDGs, uh, number three and number 17. However, it is important before we dive deep dive into them to talk a little bit about our network and what we do very briefly. Actually, um, if I have to, uh, talk about uh, in back in 2000, um, Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, noticed that businesses can no longer work, uh, do business as usual. And they had to somehow notice that they cannot use the resources the way they do as if there is no tomorrow. So along with 40 uh, companies, he started working on addressing universal and global issues. And finally develop what we call today the 2030 Agenda. What is the 2030 Agenda? If I talk about no poverty, zero hunger, quality education, clean water, and so on and so forth, all of these are universal and pressing issues. And they had to work under the um, um, principle that they all affect our lives and they are to the, today based on the UN 10 principles which, conclude, which um, include anti-corruption, human rights, labor rights and environment. And it is very important to mention that the SDGs, if you work on one, you can automatically in, um, influence the other one. So if, for example, I'm talking about good health, if I work on no poverty, I automatically am addressing also good health. If I'm talking about quality education, I'm also um, working on decent work and economic growth. If I talk about clean water and sanitation, I'm also addressing the good health and well-being. So they are very much interrelated all together and you cannot tackle one without falling onto the other. However, people need to focus on some indicators in each one of them in order to be able to work better on them. Um, the UN Global Compact today is composed of more than 13,000 businesses across the world. And of course, it also includes 3,800 non-businesses. Why non-businesses? Even though the Global Compact addresses basically businesses, however, non-businesses today play an immense role. And you are a beautiful example of that. They, and especially in Lebanon, 
today they are the acting force on the ground. So they need to be in this network in order also to be able to collaborate with the businesses as well. We cover more than 160 countries and we are one of the 69 networks across the world, which actually sums up to uh, reaching out to more than 87 million employees across the world. So this is who we are in a nutshell. If I want to talk about the SDG that are at stake today, SDG, good health and well-being. It's true that it sounds like one word, however, it has multiple indicators and targets beneath them. Like for, I'm not going to mention all of them, however, um, and most of you already mentioned, um, most of the speakers already mentioned some of them like um, tobacco control, vaccines and medicine, increased health financing and workforce, and uh, so on and so forth. But we are all concerned eventually by the 3.4, which is really to do prevention and treatment and promote health and uh, mental health and well-being. Are we on track? The SDGs actually is not that we want to er eradicate all of them. However, we have uh, targets and indicators that we need to reach. And these are, this is what we call that, that we, uh, the 2030 agenda because this is the date where we're supposed to reach them but we are not on track. Unfortunately, we are somehow 62 years behind schedule on the progress that is estimated to be done on the SDG number three. Yes, there are a lot of um, progress that has been made against several of the leading causes of this and diseases and life expectancy has increased dramatically, but it has um, decreased unevenly between within one country and across countries. So there remains a huge gap. And um, if we have to ensure healthy lives for all, it requires a strong commitment and it requires a lot of money, that's true. And we know that healthy people are the foundation for healthy economies. But if we don't do anything, and if we don't pay now today to be able to work on these SDGs, the cost will be much higher later on. And action needs to be, to be made very quickly. We can no longer work as if there's, uh, it's easier than expected. So there are ways where we can, uh, most of the speakers before me uh, mentioned awareness and they mentioned prevention versus care. If today we invest, uh, we are investing in care and care is costing us a lot of money. However, if we work on prevention, this will decrease the health bill at the end. We can work on awareness, and uh, I think um, uh, the previous um, uh, Dr. Pritchard Jones talked about it before, and advocacy as well, and action needs to be made. And we have opportunities. Um, I would hate to mention that I consider that pandemic is an opportunity also today, because it has first highlighted the fragility of health, it has highlighted the importance of the, the health capital of people, and it has also precipitated the world into remote communication, which made it very easy for people to communicate and collaborate together. Of course, we have the communication channels today. It's very easy to reach for people uh, through social media, through networks, and more than ever, the civil sector, public sector, and private sector are all in this all together. And for this, we have the SDG number 17. SDG number 17 is not a goal by itself. It is how we can reach the goals all together. And it's one of the most important ones because uh, we need to cross sector and cross country collaboration in order to be able to achieve the goals and the number three goal. And there's a difference between collaboration and many people talked about partnerships and there are, there's a huge difference between collaboration um, and uh, uh, partnership because collaboration, and I would add also to it coordination also because there is coordination, there might be collaboration and there is partnership. Uh, coordination and collaboration are for a very short time. It's something that comes um, without any framework. However, partnership, is something that needs a framework and that needs to be really defined with clear objectives, with strict guidelines and a way to measure the partnership and how it's uh, ongoing. And these will allow, and I will mention only a few uh, positive impact of partnership. It's probably one of the very few times where equation of one plus one it becomes five, because if we work two together, the impact is of five people. We, at first, we avoid redundancy. 
We can share information and best practices and avoid loss of time and loss of cost. We can do things more efficiently. We can save human resources. We can have a maximized outreach. We can establish accountability. We can have a bigger geographical spread. We can maximize value and we can operate um, sustainable impact. And instead of doing a punctual cha uh, change, it can be a transformer, uh, transformation change with um, with the impact of things happening on a more sustainable level. Um, and it does not have to be local and it does not have to be cross-sector. It can be within the same sector and cross-sector. And um, I think with today, if I have to think of the global compact, what we do most, and it's not in our mandate, is to bridge people together. When somebody needs to get in touch with somebody else, it's uh, very easy to do it through a network. And every single sector, if I have to look at the landscape of development in the world, it is divided, it's true, by public sector, private sector, and civil society. Uh, public sector, of course, you know what it means. Private sector is, includes academia, media, and businesses. And the civil society includes NGOs, international NGOs, UN systems, donors, agencies, and foundations. If we look at them, they are more of a piece, uh, piece of puzzles. And you see them working in here sporadically and in silos. However, if they work as uh, puzzles and they can combine and align, they can all bring something to the table and eventually have more impact. And every single sector has something to bring to the table. Um, NGOs uh, bring technical knowledge, capacity building, access to deep knowledge of communities, legitimacy, social capital, passion, and people focused. And more and more we see that the NGOs who are working properly are people with governance, who are working in order to be legitimate more and more. And they are working in systems that allow them to be able to be credible in order for them to get the partners on board. If we look at the public sector, it's the regulatory framework, taxation, public systems, long-term planning, sustainability, capacity building, provision of land and supporting infrastructure. Academia can provide data, evidence, research, convening power and access to students because at the end of the day, students are also people that we need to reach out to because these are the, the leaders of tomorrow and these are the people who can also lead on tomorrow. If we look at UN agencies and international NGOs, they have the political capital, legitimacy, convening power, technical support and knowledge, and of course the global network with ground pre presence. Businesses. Businesses are market-based. They have a value creation approach. They have brands, they have access to customer base, employees, I would add to the stakeholders, shareholders, they have products and services, technology, they are mostly bringing innovation on the ground into partnership. They have efficiency, management systems, value chains, infrastructures, logistics, data, and financial and in-kind contribution. And I'm mentioning all this because basically usually what happens is whenever we talk about businesses, everybody thinks about the money and the financial contribution, whereas they can bring so much more on board than this. Uh, if we look at this picture, actually, uh, in partnering, and this is something that is very um, uh, important to highlight, when you are partnering, there, there should be a balance of power. It's not one person or one entity leading over the other. It is uh, people working together with a clear framework, with measurement uh, systems in place. And um, I cannot, in Lebanon, unfortunately, the mentality that we have is um, people are afraid of each other. And the first basis of partnership is trust. And um, unfortunately, trust is very difficult to obtain unless you have legitimacy and credibility on what you do. And this is where, why I talk about governance. And, uh, but there is one example actually that uh, I think moved me a lot is uh, unfortunately the Beirut blast brought in people together. And this was probably one of the very few times where we saw the Lebanese communities, NGOs, public sectors, uh, private sector, all collaborating. And eventually 
uh, developing base camps where they divided the work with clear measurements and clear guidelines and who does what. And everybody had his role to play. And this is where they were efficient. Before they partnered, they had no efficiency on the ground. And when they started collaborating on dividing the sectors for constructions, for the contractors, the mental health, the health, the food, the data centers, the open data source, volunteers provision, all of them came together and it's very important to see that when we think that we are all in this together, we work better together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dina. Indeed, uh, also beautiful perspective of sustainability and the importance of partnerships and how everyone can play a role in cancer control. Um, we reach our um, final speaker for today, and uh, I would say it's the cherry on top and uh, the cream that's even in the, in the cake that makes everything so much sweeter and so much nicer. Uh, allow me to introduce Ms. Janine Kura, uh, who is a childhood cancer survivor and a member of the CCCL Champion Circle, an advocate of cancer control in Lebanon and currently occupies a regional leadership role in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, Janine, after receiving her degree from the Lebanese American University, joined MSD Lebanon and has over the past 11 years held various national, regional and global leadership roles. She is a strong believer in the importance of her work and has in contributing to the mission of saving and improving people's lives, while being an advocate for women empowerment, which she has further nurtured and developed through the Qiyadat Women in Leadership program from Georgetown University. Janine, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karen. Can you hear me well? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you, Karen and Tim, for first of all, inviting me to take part of this session and sharing my story as a reflection of the today discussed partnerships, support, and, and collaborative efforts, and how they, do they really impact the patient's lives at the end. She has her mother's eyes. She has her father's nose. She has cancer. This was one of the awareness campaigns on childhood cancer that the Children's Cancer Center had launched back in Lebanon. Seeing those billboards on the road, one's initial reaction might be, poor little girl, God forbid, or gladly it's not happening to me. Well, I used to react in the same way. However, 17 years ago, I was that little girl. 17 years ago, I was just a teenager with dreams and ambitions that were larger than life. Yet, a teenager that was struck with the news of being diagnosed with osteosarcoma. Quite a big word that I did not fully understand back then. However, I knew that this would require me to pause my life to now fight cancer. It was Christmas of 2004 when it all started with a swelling near my femur that I confused with a dance injury, only then to realize that things will forever change. Definitely an unpleasant gift for the holidays. A million questions once once hit with the news crossed my mind. Will I survive? Will I lose my hair? Will I get to go to school again and time with, fi with family and friends? Or does it all end here? It definitely was not an easy journey, not to me, nor to my loved ones. My protocol consisted of one year of six cycles of chemotherapy coupled with a lymph salvage surgery. In other words, going to go through the widely known side effects that makes you look practically like an alien with no hair, no eyebrows, not even lashes, makes you feel continuously nauseous with vomiting and disgust, resulting in the loss of around 40 pounds. But the real deal was not here. The real deal resided in the unexpected challenges that surfaced, starting with the post-surgery depression mode that hit me and brought me to the verge of becoming anorexic, to requiring six full long months to learn how to walk again. The best of them all, sudden brain blood clots, which back then affected my ability to properly articulate and sometimes speak. I couldn't have imagined myself doing so and going through all of this in some place other than the center. It was the only place in Lebanon requiring and offering advanced protocol and medical care, allowing me to overcome such handicaps while not even having to worry about their financial burden. Because worth mentioning here and as discussed before with the esteemed speakers, 
we do lack governmental support or enough governmental support and funding for this. A center where I made dear friendships, where, where the staff became family and with love, care and attention like no other. Lucky I was, yes. While all of life's worries stand short in front of this malignant disease, however, for a teenager, those so-called meaningless worries represented an integral part of life. I knew that my sole objective there was to survive. However, it would have been devastating for me to know that I would need to do so at the expense of my future dreams and plans. Easier said than done. Six months down the road, I was already exhausted and I was diving into a depressive downfall. When I realized that if I was to survive, I would want to pick up my life from where I paused it. I would want to look back at this phase as a transitory one and not a handicap. And that was my turning point. Back then I was in a critical academic year, a stepping stone to high school and requiring me to sit for the official brevet exams to pass. For the immunocompromised alien that I was, who was unable to properly walk, sitting for chemo sessions, which gave me no energy to sit in schools for long hours, nor even the minimal immunity to be able to be amongst crowds. Sitting for those exams at the of, uh, officially designated centers was close to a suicide mission. However, we were, we were so decided to do it. And here came the idea with the help of the center, family and friends to file for a case for exceptional approval at the ministry to request me attending those exams in my hospital bed at the center. And so it was. I had only two months remaining to catch up on the lost curriculum where all of the people around me deployed all of their expertise in tutoring me to be ready. The time came, I sat for the exams and passed with distinction. Once fully recovered, I joined back my classmates in high school. One year later, after I was fully absent, believing that there is life with cancer. And if this life is properly nurtured and taken care of, can become a bridge to a bigger, brighter future. The best thing is that the CCL, CCCL took it further and became an officially designated center by the Lebanese Ministry of Education for children to sit for their official exams without having to worry about cancer delaying their education. While many of you might think that post-survival life for a child might be traumatizing, scarred, or even anxious. Well, I'll tell you that surviving cancer teaches you life's biggest lessons, no matter how young you may be. You learn to be grateful, to have faith, to cherish the ones who love you most. You learn to put passion in everything that you do and to dream big. Even if life stumbles you along the way, Keep something to remind you of how strong you were and can be and keep going. It is true that God, God gave me another chance to live and to survive, but I also had another chance to save my legs at times where my risk of amputation was high. It was due to a new surgical technique that my doctor was able to extract that infected femur, replace it internally with a prosthesis while containing all the functionality of my leg. It's true that this prosthesis requires revision surgery every decade or so, but guess what? That was the something I decided to keep as my reminder. 12 years post survival, and when the time came to replace that initial prosthesis, I asked for that strong piece of titanium that I had in me, took it home, and with the help of a friend, turned it into a beautiful table lap that in case you can show it, Karen, on the slide. A piece of me that will remain a constant reminder of how strong I was and can be. You might be asking yourself, well, why a table lamp? Uh, that's because to represent as engraved on it that there is always light at the end of every tunnel, no matter how dark your days might be. All of us might have lost a dear person for cancer. And so have I. The loss of my brave uncle two months ago for renal cell carcinoma hit me hard, but it also reminded me that I must be alive today for a reason, and so are you. So better make it a meaningful one. 17 years later, I am both proud and grateful to have been able to fight life's most challenging battles, to have been surrounded with unconditional support and medical care, 
allowing me to answer all of the questions I had initially asked myself. Yes, I have survived. Yes, I have lost my hair along the way, but only for it to grow back even stronger as I have. Yes, I have caught up with my academic year and chased my dreams. And yes, have learned to cherish my family who are my biggest support system, my friends and center like ours for pushing me to always stand tall and fight, fight for life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Janine. This was, this was really beautiful. And um, you can see the round of applause in our room, truly beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, as we end our talks on a very uh, high and emotional and beautiful note, I'd like to open the floor for questions. We already have some in, um, in the chat, which I'm going to start by sharing. Um, so, I think we had a question from Ibtihal. Um, Aya, if you have it uh, ready. Okay. All right, so a question from Dr. Ibtihal Fathi from uh, the WHO and the NCD Alliance. Uh, I think it's addressed to CCCL, so it's addressed to Hanna. How do you see the CCCL role in advancing universal health coverage or cancer services implementation in Lebanon and the region? Well, allow me first uh, to thank Janine for the amazing uh, intervention. Um, is she and the members of the Champion Circle are always our inspiration and our uh, power to keep uh, to keep us going through difficult times, especially the ones that we are passing through, uh, specifically uh, within the last two years. Now, regarding the universal health coverage, well, it's a very broad topic. And I guess that uh, implementing it in Lebanon and the region would require uh, many collaborations, many partnerships from uh, high income countries in order to develop specific programs so that we can closely coordinate with the ministries of public, uh, public health. Um, the CL experience throughout the years had shown that uh, through its mission, we can and proper governance and definitely with proper quality of care, we can provide this treatment to uh, our children and we can have it as an opportunity and build on such a successful model in order to be able to finance the, uh, such coverages. This will be uh, only feasible and implemented if it can be supported publicly and privately uh, within uh, the authorities. And uh, this is where, um, like providing accurate diagnosis and proper treatment will play, play an important factor. So uh, this will take us back to the importance of uh, having uh, such partnerships and such collaborations within, uh, among every, everyone. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rilla, you have your hand raised. Uh, I also want to seize the opportunity so anybody who wants to share their question and speak live, they can raise their hand just like Dr. Rula did. Sadeli, Dr. Rula. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank uh, CCCL for uh, organizing this today and for bringing all the stakeholders together. And I want to take this opportunity uh, to highlight again that, you know, what Lebanon had been living. It's, it's not really just a crisis, it is really a, a dramatic situation that we have to live. And I want to thank uh, WHO with Andre, uh, CCI, Childhood Cancer International, SIOP, and CCCL for standing together in this difficult time to uh, raise a bit of the Lebanese people. What I want to say is that uh, the, the Leb Lebanese people and Lebanon, what we are doing is okay, it's resilience, but it's way too much, way too much resilience. Uh, we are accepting things that are way beyond human rights, basic rights for children. Imagine that we got to a point in Lebanon where cancer patients were on the streets, having a manifestation, leaving the hospitals and manifesting on the streets in order to access their basic rights, which is access to medications. Uh, 
And still now, two years after the serious economic crash and, and uh, a year after the blast, still the medication issue is not completely resolved. And I think this uh, should be a priority for both children and adult uh, cancer patients. The prices of the medications is an inflation. The access is not granted. The companies uh, are, uh, are uh, doing their best, but still not, deal, not resolving the issue, neither the ministry. So how to resolve that? This is my first question. And the second part of my question is, we don't really get a grasp in Lebanon and the MENA region of the uh, impact of this, the real impact on, uh, on the cancer burden, meaning delays in diagnosis, we don't know exactly the numbers, uh, dropout rates, we don't know exactly the numbers. Um, we still don't have a real national or local registry of the number of cancer patients, adults and kids, what is the burden, and neither do we the clear idea of the cancer survival and I'm talking as, an, as a pediatric oncologist and also as a president of Chance Association which is one of the other local NGOs that is involved for 20 years in um, advocating for children and covering the cost of treatment. It has been a, a great, uh, uh, I would say, uh, awakening to collaborate together and I would like to thank Hannah and CCCL and Karen. We have had very good collaboration together, sharing our, our resources, sharing our capacities, sharing medications, uh, sharing patients, uh, you know, treatments, you know, just to, to enhance the performance. But still, there is, there is a lot to do. And um, this, this, is, this meeting brings us all together again to brainstorm on a priority list of how we should have, how we should work with all, uh, all of you who have very good intentions. Um, to resolve uh, the issues for our children and our adults here. But if we, if we can put together a roadmap of priority list, it would be nice. And the medication issue, if you have any input uh, on networks. Now, we found networks for us to resolve the situation for the chance patients, but it's not a national strategy. I, or, I don't want to mention the refugees, which are also left with not always sustainable programs, programs start, and then in the middle of, you know, halfway, the programs stop. So how to assure, my third, my third issue, sustainability of programs that start for a certain period of time, how to make sure that they will continue. So I know these are big issues, but this is what's going through my mind right Thank now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lula. A lot of a lot of issues. I think we, we discussed a, a few of them in uh, in some of the presentations. Um, anybody from the speakers would like to share that? I think Dr. Andre, maybe with the Global Initiative on Childhood Cancer, we can support anything in that, or maybe a look at the medications. Uh, Hannah, I also saw your uh, your your microphone is 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 on. So uh, please, speakers. Uh, yes, Hannah, you can go ahead. I can follow afterwards. Okay, um, I, I say thank you so much, Rella, for highlighting all um, uh, these issues. Yes, indeed, these are uh, very important uh, factors, and this is what we suffer uh, from on, uh, in our day, uh, every day. Uh, now, just answering a few points and very quickly in order to allow the chances for others to, um, I would begin with the crisis of medication, where we had launched earlier this year the Treat Me campaign in order for us to ensure the uh, medications and where CCCL had been active, uh, proactive uh, in 2019 in securing these before they got, uh, before the we have before the shortages uh, start, and uh, we had create we had like well, like we mentioned earlier in the um, after the blast. Uh, had uh, announced our hotline, uh, which every, everyone, even patients or uh, parents or even doctors can contact us with and we can support as much as possible. And I think we had coordinated earlier for that. I know that this is not the national solution that you want to expect. However, in such difficult times, this is the best that CCCL can do. And we will remain here for our uh, patients in order to support them in every step. Now, concerning the registry, we had signed in 2019 as well, in October uh, 2019, an agreement with the Ministry of Public Health. But this is where we will need the collaboration of both hospital 
patients and pediatric oncologists. Pediatric oncologists all need to support us in uh, compiling and in consolidating these data. This is the main problem, unfortunately. This is where the main problem is, is that either the doctors do not have the proper, um, the proper, the proper um, records or even they don't have the time in order to provide us with this. And we would definitely love to have your cooperation uh, in order to promote and to encourage other doctors because uh, I think your word will be most uh, more sound to them if they hear it from, an, from another pediatric oncologist. Uh, I hope I have answered uh, most of your questions. I guess there was one more point, but I'm not uh, able to remember it. The sustainability of the refugee. Yeah, the sustainability, exactly. The sustainability of the refugees, yes, indeed, you are right. But what we had established in uh, the child, uh, at the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon, because um, as you know, we have specific programs with limited and specific guidelines. And this is where uh, for the refugees. Uh, so uh, these grants have been complemented by the Children's Cancer Center of Lebanon. So whatever grant that comes and it is, um, it, the treatment has to stop somewhere because of relapse or because of further treatment, that is bone marrow transplants, we are guiding uh, in collaboration and in close coordination with the pediatric oncologist, we are guiding patients to, uh, uh, to continue their treatment. Uh, in different in different ways. So this is where uh, the support of the patients and the support of the uh, pediatric oncologist as well is needed in order for them to, in order for us to be able to continue this treatment for as many patients as possible. And if you have specific cases, please feel free to contact me directly for it. Sure. Thank, thank you. you. You have been amazing and very helpful all over. Thank you. Dr. Andre, would you like to add anything? Yeah, thank you really, Karen. Thank you uh, also to our dear colleague Rula for all her work and her leadership in the community and beyond. Just to add a few brief points on the medicines, this is of course something at WHO and if Tahalo can speak to this as well, that we have been very closely following. There has been a new opportunity for WHO to look and support procurement of quality assured cancer medicines for children in the country and also potentially for adults as well. So there has been a lot of dialogue within the international community and this is a recognized uh, need and concern. Uh, WHO also, as well as UNICEF and some other UN agencies maintain a catalog of cancer medicines that can be accessed by anyone. And these are quality assured cancer medicines. And depending on the situation, there may be support for procurement and supply chain management as well. So please note that there is a recognition that quality assurance is a concern. There is a recognition, stock ops are common and there are pathways now we're developing to help reduce some of those issues. Uh, briefly on the data front, for us, yes, of course, there is a need to build registries, but we also have to start showing the value of why registries are important. And this is something we've been discussing with IARC. There's a lot of data that is already available. And as you rightly said, Dr. Hanna, how do we synthesize and interpret the data? Because it doesn't take very much to be able to show the value. If it is, for example, the total number of children who have received care, someone presented this well, a decrease from 2020 to 2021 already gives a suggestion on variations in coverage, and this is a threat to universal health coverage. So how do we use data and then reinforce the principles of health information systems and registries by showing why they're important? So this is, a, in fact, a nice outcome from the discussion. We can follow up as a group and see how can we look at the data from uh, Lebanon and use platforms like CCCL, WHO, partners, and show, look, this is the reality of what's happening. Uh, that is the power of data. If we don't use that currency, it's going to get lost. So I'm very happy to follow up and discuss that further. Thank you, Dr. Andre. That's indeed a very, very great point to mention and the importance of data, especially in our time today is, is, really, is really huge. Uh, Dr. Itihad, sorry for keeping you long uh, waiting, but your hand is raised, please, Fadali. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Karen. Thank you colleagues for coming up and uh, having this very, very interesting and super session. And uh, and uh, today, I th I think I mean we when we start when I put the uh, the question regarding universal health coverage, 
I want to pass on a message that despite all the difficulty and things you have uh, currently in Lebanon, which is, uh, has been, uh, you know, uh, very clear to us from the region, as well as has been pointed out by Dr. Nada, uh, you managed to do a lot and you managed to do a lot as a civil society. We are very proud of your work. And we are going to say, you know, if you if you can do this, it means everyone can do it in terms of the context of universal health coverage. So we, <clears throat> as a civil society, uh, as a, a member of the WHO advisory group, we are supporting you and we will be uh, supporting and trying to maintain your activity for and they're looking for the way forward. Uh, you have many difficulty and you have many shortages that need to be, uh, you know, work collaboratively together. Uh, the issue which is um, regarding the drugs, um, av availability of the drugs and medicine, I think Lebanon have one of the best um, uh, examples, uh, practices in the region of uh, sort of combined um, uh, recruitment uh, or one recruitment for chronic disease. Uh, I'm sure uh, cancer medicine is one of them, but uh, also under the initiative of the Global um, Childhood Initiative, which is one of the best uh, initiative to improve childhood survival in the region. Uh, as uh, Catherine has uh, rightly mentioned, there is a sixth country in the region which has proceeded with an initiative. Another on, along on this side, uh, the uh, availability of the medicine. It's only, you know, like the negotiation between the Ministry of Health and WHO, and that might be a, a somehow <clears throat> a limitation for Lebanon. However, I think colleague in WHO can work it around uh, to, to work with you as a civil society or a standalone cancer center uh, to be part of this initiative. Uh, I, think, I think the work on... Um, uh, you, we, we need to highlight your work on uh, supporting refugees from Iraq, uh, Syria, and the region, uh, and uh, considering, you know, like your limitation and uh, shortages in terms of financial shortage, still you are supporting uh, the regional uh, childhood cancer uh, from different countries affected by crisis. Uh, your work in the public-private uh, partnership is very highly acknowledged, and this is one of the areas you are excellent and could provide a best practice for other countries in the region and globally, <clears throat> how to en engage the private sectors uh, and uh, keep, uh, you know, like uh, uh, a good uh, practice in public-private partnership. I will stop here and thank you for the initiative. Thank you, Abtihal. Thank you. Indeed, if it's anything from this discussion is that we need to have more conversations, really leverage the WHO support and all the initiatives that have been going on and, and really collaborate and partner together. Uh, Kathy, you have your, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Thank you, Karen. I just wanted to make a further remark about the importance of cancer registration and working with leveraging the support being offered by IARC for improvements around childhood cancer. Um, you know, the thing that cancer registries are really good at is counting new cases in a population. And to me, one of the next best things that you can do, apart from encouraging your national cancer registry in Lebanon to be able to use the international classification of childhood cancer number three. Uh, so your registries are high quality in terms of what types of cancer you're treating is to see if you can um, work with them. And it needs a clinical registry partnership to capture tumor stage at diagnosis according to the international Toronto consensus guidelines. And we've got a big project going on with mainly European registries, but also Brazil, Australia, Canada, Japan, and uh, Boston in the US to see if we can apply Toronto staging across a range of childhood cancers at a population level. And the reason I emphasize this is that, you know, it's easier probably to capture stage at diagnosis than it is to capture and document what happens to the child afterwards, you know, in terms of therapies and so on. 
And this is such an important metric if we're going to understand the impact of advocacy and campaigns to achieve earlier diagnosis and more rapid referral pathways from first hint, suspicion of cancer to actually being in the place to receive a diagnosis and treatment. So I think, you know, cancer registries will only improve if they're useful. And to just allow the registration to try and improve itself, it has to be a partnership with clinicians. And now is a real opportune time because you've got people like Max Parkin working with IARC and he's been helping some of the sub-Saharan cancer, African cancer registries collect a tumor stage at diagnosis and, uh, with a recent publication, which sadly shows about half the children or more are presenting with metastatic disease in some of the solid tumors. Hopefully that's not the case in Lebanon, but you know, you don't know at a population level at the moment, I suspect. And this would be something that's achievable and could be achieved, I think, within the next two to three years if you uh, were able to put resources into that. Thank you so much. This is indeed, indeed very important. I remember your slide uh, mentioning the barriers and for childhood cancer and uh, uh, early early diagnosis was something very uh, uh, was a major was a major point and I think it could be a good starting point for us to to look at this and and gather data around it. Um, I think we're almost uh, at the hour. Uh, beautiful two hours of of uh, great talks and a great conversation. Uh, if nobody has any more questions, I want to uh, thank again our amazing speakers for their time today and for sharing these beautiful insights. I also want to thank all, all of you who attended uh, these two hours. We, 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 I hope this was, this was really beneficial and um, a good starting point for, for many more to come. Janine, uh, I think you, 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 uh, you, you, you hit you hit you hit the thing on the nail, uh, and really inspired us to uh, to continue with this and have have more action. Uh, the time is to act is now, as 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 Hannah mentioned, and imagine just the amount of lives we can save. So thank you everyone. Thank you to the London Global Cancer Week. A huge thank you to Aya Sophia Khairallah and 